in barbarism, and unquote. When we Max P died into my school experience, and hey, reflect on that experience, I have come to understand that teachers or students, or both, who lack historical and cultural consciousness, sometimes let themselves get trapped in the linguistic oppression of the colonizer, who always expect the colonizer to speak their language. This sad experience with my high school teachers and college teachers as, as well, more importantly, let me better understand that the school system of the country represents its ideological apparatus. Therefore, if any radical social, cultural, and political changes are to occur, it must, be, it must begin the school system that has been historically used to maintain or challenge the status quo. It goes without saying that the school system can be a dangerous institution that reproduces the dominant ideology or it could be a sign of struggle where ideological and political fights for a just democratic society can take place, which will lead me to education under occupation. As a teacher, I have been always interested in exploring the relation between education and occupation. To my knowledge, not too many studies have carefully looked at how the education system of countries that were colonized is impacted by occupation. Studies have most for the, mostly have focused on the social, economic, and political aspects of, uh, of occupation. So in critically reflecting on the dialectical relation between education and occupation, many pertinent questions have crossed my mind. And some of the questions that I would like to share with you are the following. Can one possibly learn when one constantly has to worry about one's safety and move, and move from one region to another to avoid bombs being dropped on one's house and one's, and one's head? How can learning take place when these bombs destroy schools and other institutions? Can one learn when, is, when one is constantly running away from bloodshed and terror? Can learning be possible? When does it know if one will wake up the next day? Does it make any sense at all to talk about learning when one is facing hunger and starvation and for an occupied land? In short, is it conceivable to talk about education under occupation? Well, as a post-colonial subject who was born and raised in a country and partially educated in a country that was colonized by France for over for a century and occupied by the United States for about 20 years, I have always wanted to seek answer to these questions. But before I shed light on them, I would like to, I would like to attempt to attribute a definition to occupation. In other words, I want to define education in my own words. In my view, education can be defined as the physical, military, and ideological settlement of a powerful country and or all poor people in a foreign land which they forcibly invade and thereafter occupy as if it's their own territory. During the early stages of occupation, the occupying forces use, often use the media as a means to propagate, to spread lies and false hope about the violent action, because after all, occupation is a violent action against the occupied, while instilling fear in the psyche of the occupied people. During these stages, what helps sustain the occupier is not so much the infrastructure of the country that has been occupied, because such infrastructure is destroyed during the military operation that leads to the occupation. What helps, what helps the occupying forces sustain whatever they are doing there is the, the, the ideological machine that they put in place before, during, and after occupation. This machine is often made of some segments in the army, agents of, you know, of secret information, like CIA. The, sometimes the church, and all the time, the media. Through such an apparatus, through such a machine, ideological agents, like the master brands, often use you know, all lies to control the mind of people who are being occupied. In most cases, if not all, occupation is a, of a foreign land is motivated by economic, political, and geo-territorial strategic interests of the powerful country that occupies it. However, these interests 
often hidden, often concealed by the occupying country, which often lies, often lies about its actions. Beside the harmful effect that occupation has on education, which I should talk about later in depth, it disastrously, it harmfully affects the environment, the culture, and the subjectivity of people who are being occupied. By the environment, I'm not only referring to the trees that are being destroyed, the animals that are being killed, but also to the water and the air that are con often contaminated as a result of the massive cross of bombs that are used during the occupation. This debris of, the debris of these bombs are often left abandoned on the ground and become as harmful as the bombs themselves. Consequently, innocent children who, after the occupation, continue to play on those grounds, run the gravest risk of being infected and dying from these bombs. This is the human tragedy that, that is often concealed through the mass mainstream media. Throughout history, occupation has been the expansionist project of imperial powers, starting with the Greek and Roman empires. It has been carried over by Western countries such as France, Great Britain, Spain, Portugal, and more recently the United States that became a powerful country, especially after the Second World War. But I must mention that it's not only Western countries that have invaded and occupied foreign lands. We have non-Western countries such as China, Indonesia, and Israel that have invaded and occupied countries such as Tibet, East Timor, and Palestine, although the occupation is already supported by the US and Great Britain. But regardless of the, form and sh and of the form and shape of any occupation and the economic and political interests that are forming, its devastating effect, whether it's cultural, political, economic, often, often leave a deep wound, a deep scar to those who are being occupied. Now, what about education? How is it being affected by occupation? <coughs> well, it's not only the cultural, social, economic, and political system of a country, of an occupied country that is affected by occupation. Equally damaging is the school system of these countries, which the occupying force use as a means to circulate its lies and falsification about the history of, the, of those who are being occupied. To achieve such a goal, the occupying force tried to control the school system by getting rid of teachers who pose a threat to its corporate interests and hiring new teachers who serve such an interest. And so occupied lands such as Haiti and Puerto Rico. The occupying forces like the US They brought in their own teachers to teach the, 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 the language, meaning English, to teach the, those who are being occupied their own values and cultures. Not only to teach them, but to impose those values on them. And they did that with a clear objective in mind, that is to civilize, civilize those who are being occupied. But I wonder how an occupying force can civilize an occupying people through occupation which is nothing else but its violent actions against the latter. In my opinion, occupation can only lead to the decivilization of those who are being occupied. My fellow, my fellow human beings as Western imperial power have shifted the economic and political policies from colonialism to neocolonialism. It's imperative that we, neocolonial subjects, me, and allies, hopefully you, <laughs> stay ideologically and politically alert so that we can map out such a gigantic shift and resist it. It's also crucially important that we stay politically engaged with the world and act upon it. By that I mean we need to take part in any grassroots movement aiming to fight against Western neocolonial and neoliberal liberal agenda. An agenda that is intended to explore and dehumanize those farmers in Haiti and India, and those who are working in factories, whether it's here or elsewhere. 
the struggle against Western neocolonial and neoliberal agenda is a human struggle that every concerned citizen who is fighting for social, economic, political, and social, sexual justice should be engaged in. In other words, this is not a struggle that only concerns or should, should only concern marginalized, neoliberal subjects such as my cousins, but it's, also, but it's a struggle that should concern all of us as human beings. I think I'll stop here for questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions that I may be able to answer. <laughs> yes? You spoke clearly about the development of your own critical consciousness and thinking, and then <coughs> we learned about your growth and development as a thinker and intelligent person. And now you've been here working and uh, assisting young people do you have any observations about the place of critical thinking um, and media influences in this country and what it does to the citizenry here? Never mind someone somewhere else who might be in a colonized situation. But well, through dialogue with young folks, don't get it right, so I'm still young. Um, <laughs> what I realized is that this, this, this speech but the speech that they make all the time, what they say all the time, or most of the time, is that, um, well, lead me to believe that they are, some of them, not all of them, obviously, uh, they are demoralized, demoralized by the media. So the, the idea that the media is constantly selling them is, you know, is, uh, is really uh, dreadful, if I may use that word. Uh, I think we, as teachers, we need to take the media in, into our classroom to deconstruct the message that, you know, that's being sent to our children. Um, unfortunately, we don't do much of that. We should do more. We should um, talk to the youth and let them know that the media plays a central role in their life, whether they want, they want, whether they want to admit it or not. Because that's the media, what I, by, the, by the media, I'm not referring only to TV. You know, this is part of the media with images. You know, you know, they are bombarding us. Wherever you go, you see something, and there's always a message. Whether it's overt or, 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 or hidden, the message always there. Now, the challenge is how you take that message and make sense of it. Okay? Because message from the media will always be sent to us. But how do you absorb it? And how do you use it? Unfortunately, many young folks. Whatever this in this in the media, that's what they want to produce. And what they report is necessarily a good thing. In other words, the media tell them how they should behave. What makes them human? For them to be to be human is to have the, the latest pair of jeans, the latest the most expensive uh, shirt or, or sneakers. But how do we help them deconstruct that belief? How do we do that? Well it's, it's by opening, you know, it's by Dialoguing, dialoguing with them uh, by making them believe the media can be a good tool if you know how to use it. I, I hope that answers your question. Um, I, I like your story about being in Haiti and in school. I really relate to it as an African American in the U.S. because a lot of the ideas in the textbooks or everything are what a lot are like all of the people that you learn about are usually white males who made this country. Mm -hmm and their ideas are like pushed on to us. How did you learn about like black people and about your history? Well, um, I had to work harder than my classmates, some of my classmates. Uh, besides what I was, in addition to what I was getting from my teachers, most of them were lies, and I, I would spend hours in the library doing my own research. Because, you know, anybody can tell anything. Now, it's up to you to believe it or not. If you think, it, if you think it's not you, it's not gonna serve any purpose for your own good, then you, don't, you reject it. But in order to reject it, you need to do your own research. So when I was in high school, I, I would do whatever is expected of me in class, but in my free time, I would go to the library and research. I would read books that would help me think. Books written by Paulo Freire, uh, Amica Cabral, Prince Fennel, 
this guy they really had me. Uh, they really shaped my thinking. Because what your teacher tells you sometimes, or most of the time, is what he or she believes. And what he or she believes is what he or she learned previously, somewhere. So you need to deconstruct what your teacher teaches you, or teach you. Um, the fact that I'm your teacher doesn't mean you should just believe whatever I say in the classroom. Because I might be saying something that I, you know, I, might, I may have an agenda. I might want you to believe certain things because it, you know, they my own interests. Now it's up to you to, to find out whether what I'm telling you is only serving my interest or serving, it's also serving yours. In order to find out about this, you need to do your own research. Talk to people. I mean, don't be shy. You know, have a conversation with people, whether they are your peers, your other teachers, talk to them. Do not believe what your teacher tell you, tells you blindly. You, not, you got to question what your teacher is telling you. Because oftentimes, teachers don't even know they're lying to you. Because they've been lying to begin with. Because teachers were stood at some point in their lives. And if they were lying throughout their, their, their academic life, most likely they're going to produce the lies that they've been told. So you need to question what your teacher is telling you, always. I see what you're saying about that, but like a lot of the time, if you go to a library and you read books, those books are also not objective. They also have their own... Uh, exactly. So you question what you read. You question what you read. You need to, you need to diversify what you read. Okay? You need to consult um, various sources. Okay, to compare, and I agree with you. I mean, when I was in Haiti, uh, um, I didn't really know my history. It was it wasn't until after I finished high school that I said to myself, "No, gee, I got to, I got to do that." Even language, go on. I didn't know how to read and write it. I had to learn it my own, myself. Mm -hmm. So, you, as a student, you really have to work harder than your teacher, because your teacher might give you maybe eighty percent of what he or she knows. The twenty percent you need to get it on your own. So books do not always tell the truth. But I'm telling the truth here. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to question what you mean. Engage, in the, engage the books. Engage the books. The book, what is a book? It's someone speaking through words. So you engage your words. You engage me when you're reading my book. I might, I might say something that you don't agree with. And you, you get it. I don't imagine. I don't agree with you. Because what you're saying doesn't make any sense. It's okay. But in order to develop critical thinking, you have to really read. Read, read, read. Whatever comes to your hand, read it. Don't believe what you read at the first time. Read it, go do some other, some more research, and go back to it to see if you can agree with it or not. Yes? I have a question. I'll pick you up. Okay. Go ahead, young man. Oh, I'm sorry. I have two questions. Um, what is your, uh, you said that you do not like the word third world country. I know I'm from Trinidad, and that's the, that word used common, the word third world country, because of uh, our, uh, our lack of knowledge, our, our money wealth, and stuff like that. What is your um, basis of saying you don't? Well, you know, so the word third world, as you know, uh, the, uh, I think I don't quite remember who came up with it. It was in the, 19, in the 1940s or the 50s, the 50s that we came up with that word. Um, I don't like it because I think it's too demeaning. Uh, <coughs> so if you have a third world country, what happened to the second world? And what happened to the first one? So you have the first one, which is the United States, you know, uh, Great Britain, France, and they put us like on the corner. So why why would I accept such a concept? I don't I don't think it's uh, it's helping us. Uh, I think they should just tell you know call us maybe developing country. Um, so I, I simply don't think it really um, um, portray a good image of us. You know, I simply don't think it it helps us at all. I like the word Western because. That, that gives me, I mean, well, I could be biased because I'm the one using that word. Uh, I think when you say the word third world, it's really sloppy. And you don't even know sometimes who, what country should classify as, as third world. Should I classify uh, Venezuela as third world country? Perhaps not, because Venezuela has resources. Should I um, call Haiti third world country? Maybe, because Haiti has a lot of you know, economic social problems. So I simply don't. This is a personal choice that I made. You might not agree with me, but I simply don't like it. Yes. How about my question? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, I know uh, you went to a community college when you mm -hmm. first got to the United States. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak about that experience and the impact that it had in your future academic okay. um, That's a good question. life. Um, well, when I came here, obviously, um, uh, all I know, I wanted to go to school. I wanted, I wanted to go back to school because I was in school when I left Haiti. So I wanted to go 
to back to school so bad. I didn't know where to go. And my brother and sister and I were going to Tunu College, the important school there. So they said, well, that would be good for you because it's cheaper and you will get a good education. I said, sure, I'll go. So that's how I ended up going to Mass Massachusetts Bay Community College, which is, a, which is located in Wesley and Farmer Um But when I was there, I, I felt somewhat isolated because I had, um, I had to overcome the language barrier. I didn't speak English. I was taking classes without any English skill whatsoever. So I would have my brother um, um, translate for me uh, what the teacher was saying. So but what I would do, I would take it to the reporter, and then I would go home and listen to it over and over and over until I finally get what the teacher was saying. But I was able to somewhat read in English, so that helped me. And because of my background in French, I was able to transfer some of the knowledge that, that I already acquired in my native language to, you know, to uh, the second language, which is English. But uh, so I, I think it's a good place to be because you, I didn't feel that I was being judged because I was like 22, I believe, 20, 22, 23 when I just, when I started going there. So I. I felt quite comfortable, I felt quite welcome, because there were people who were older than I am. Uh, I, did, I felt that I belonged. But what I did do, I tried to make the best of it. And how did I do that? I studied hard, I would go to, I didn't, I never had, I didn't have a tutor like you guys do here. So they did not have that service then yet. Maybe they do now. So I had to, you know, talk to classmates who were events that I was, who spoke English, I didn't speak English. So I would talk to some friends, some good American friends were very kind to me. They would explain to me what, you know, what was going on in the class when my brother was not around. And I stayed there for about two, two and a half years and got my, my first degree and then I moved, transferred to uh, UMass Boston. I got my bachelor's there and uh, got my master's there and, and then I came here to UMass. So community colleges are, you know, were good to me. Uh, I hope you know, it will be good to you too. And if, if you can get a good education here, it will be better than at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> um, being an educated person of color, have you found it difficult to, well, have you found yourself that there's been social pressure to adapt to American structure and assimilate to the culture? Oh, yeah, big time. Um, well, I have three things against me. Uh, as a person of color, I'm black, and I'm not from here, so that means I speak different yeah. than you do. So I have linguism against me, I have racism against me, and I have uh, xenophobia against me. So I have <coughs> things to fight against, whereas perhaps other folks of color may not have to have to fight against those those um, uh, barriers. I would say, yes. Uh, when I first came here, uh, I was expected to, to learn English, and I did. And I'm still learning it because the language, you never finish learning a language. I'm still learning it. Um, yes, I mean, I felt the need to, to learn English. Otherwise, I would, be isol I would isolate myself. I learn English. And I try to understand the culture because culture shapes us as people. But by knowing the language, I was able to understand the culture because language is part of culture. If I speak your language, most likely I'll understand your culture better because they are intertwined. They go hand in hand. Yes, I was pressured to learn it, and I went through humiliation in class. I would present in class, and nobody would understand anything that I was saying. Uh, I remember clearly there was a lady named Jennifer. Never forget. <laughs> uh, I was taking my first group process class, and I had to do presentation. I didn't speak English, and I had to do it anyway, because I was very brave. I was taking classes without any English, because I knew I could do it. Um, so it was time for me to present my paper. Oh God. <laughs> what language am I gonna use to present my paper? <laughs> English was not be fine at all, right? No, it's okay now, it's okay. It's better much better than it was 10 years ago. So I stood up. Before, I, before, I, before I, it was my time to do that, I tried to memorize my presentation. I tried to, you know, I practice, practice, practice. And I stood up and I was talking. And some people were not used to accent. They have, they have difficulty understand People who speak with an accent. Maybe that was her case. But she was pretty mean. She said, after I finish, you know, basically I was reading my presentation to, to my classmates. I'm going to do what I'm doing now. And the teacher said, Well, do you have any questions for Pierre? And 
everybody, some people ask questions, and she said, I would love to ask a question, but I, don't, I did not understand anything that he was saying. And I said to myself, okay, he said, I said you, I said, you, I, obviously I did not put a finger, I said, you're going to make me learn English as fast as, as possible. <laughs> so I was frozen, I didn't know what to say, and the class was silent. The teacher was <coughs> trying to find a nice way to solve that dilemma. And I said to my dad, I went home that day, I said, you know what, Jennifer, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to learn English. I'm going to have a father in life learning. And I've been looking for Jennifer since I never met her. <laughs> I would like to see her now. That's one thing. You know the professor named Steve. Steve. No, they, oh, sorry. Not Steve. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter about that. It doesn't matter. He was, was an English teacher. He was very kind. You know, young man, I was 24 years old, I was about his age, and I was in his class. And I, um, I was taking English 101 with him. I didn't speak English well, but I was able to, you know, put words in there to make sense. But my sister-in-law, gosh, she said, Pierre, you can do it because you have your brother with, with homework. I was having my brother while he was taking that class. But I didn't speak English then, so I said, what if I have my brother? I think I can do it too. So I went to that class, I was, oof, it was hard for me. Because English 101, you have to be able to participate in class. You have to be able to, you know, to interact with your classmates. So I couldn't do that because of the language barrier. So what I did, I, I, I took it anyway. And that English teacher was, in the beginning, was very harsh on me. So you don't belong here. I said, I think I do. I simply don't speak English, but I can do what you ask me to do. So I was able to do the work. But because I was not able to participate in class, he wanted to, you know, uh, send me back to English 195, I believe. Um, but finally, my advisor talked to her and said, I think he can do the job. It's just, he's been on the for six months. He can do it. But that English teacher was so mean to me, so mean. But when he realized that I was not, I was a decent student, you know, I, I wanted to do work, he gave me a chance. So I took the class, I passed it. Guess what? About a year ago, I, I met him at UMass. And I was on the hallway, and I, he saw me, I saw him, and we were just talking. He said, are you Pierre? I said, I'm Pierre. I said, I know you, I know you. I said, I know you too. So, in, in the class, <laughs> what are you doing here? I said, I'm getting my doctor. You're getting your doctor? I said, yeah, I'm getting my doctor. He was shocked, and he still, you know, he still, you know, he was about to apply for his doctor at UMass. So you can, you can, you can do it. You just have to believe in yourself and have, you know, peers, people who trust you, people can, you know, can help support you because you're gonna go through obstacles in life. I mean, I have a lot of obstacle to go through. And I have gone through so many already. And I'm, I know there are a lot more coming. And I'm waiting for them. So yes, I was, I was pressured to prove myself. And I'm still proving myself. And I will always prove myself. As long as, I, as long as I'm alive. Any questions? Yes. What is the college system like in Haiti? And are there requirements in terms of when you uh, proceed from high school to college? Um, Can you be more specific? Well, what types of colleges are there in Haiti, and um, are there requirements, sort of like high standards tests, like if you don't pass, you can't go further, or we do. is it just open to everyone? We do. Uh, well, let me begin by talking about the standardized test. In high school, we have two official <coughs> tests to take before you finish high school. If you don't take them, you, you got to repeat. I don't know if these, uh, I, I think they still have, have it in place. Uh, they call it you know, baccalaureate, back one, back two. Two years before you graduate high school, you have two national tests that you have to take. It's similar to MCAS here. Uh, when I was in high school, if you, um, if you fail one subject, you have to put the whole thing. Now, they make you put only the subject that you fail. Yes, you have a test that you have to pass, which is very hard. If you don't pass it, then you, you stay in high school as long as you need to. There are people who graduate high school in Haiti at the age of 26, 27. I finished at 22 because I was sick. You know, I, I was sick, and then my mother was so protective of me. She didn't send me to school until when I was six or seven years old. So that sort of delayed uh, my schooling uh, courses. But yes. You have to finish high school, you have to pass those two tests, which are very, very hard, then you go to college. Now, if you go to a private school, you have the money, you're fine, but if you, have to, if you have to go to a state school, you really have to prepare because there's a test that you have to take, 
before you, um, in order to uh, start university. Here at HCC, I don't know how to do it, but in Haiti, it's very competitive because there aren't too many universities. So only the, the best students are the ones who get to go to state universities. And I'm not saying I'm one of the best, but I, did, I, did, I was able to go. Silence. Yes, um, go ahead. Um, Pierre, you talked about, I, and I loved how you spoke about this, that in your educational experience, when the uh, only thing that you were taught about was the French history, mm -hmm. and basically, um, not your own people, but the people of the colonizers, yeah. that there was a resistance in you in terms of wanting to learn. Yep. And actually you spoke of that that was the experience of, of Haitian students. Right. And so I, I, I what's the question? The question is, um, similar to what Barry was asking you, have you seen anything similar to that here in our country? Because certainly we know also similar to what this gentleman was saying, that we're often promoting a more white male uh, experience around education. So have you seen it here in the US? And what would you suggest to students and teachers in regards to that resistance? Excellent question. Um, I'm not from here. I don't, I don't want to claim that I know everything about the history and culture of this country. But what I've seen, what I've witnessed personally, is that as that young man mentioned earlier, uh, the history textbooks, for example, when you when you open them, what what do you see? Who do you see? Right. So, what I would suggest is we need to we need to change the curriculum. We need to in, to we need to in, um, we need to include incorporate other histories, other cultures in the curriculum. Because it's hard when African Americans do not know about the history because the teachers never will talk about the history. Of, they don't talk about slavery, as slavery never happened. Why not talk, why not talk about it? Oh, it's, it's just it's such a heated subject, I don't want to get into it. Well, we should talk about it. It's unfortunate that some African American students I know, they don't really know much about the history. Why is that? Because their history never taught in school. I think their history needs to be taught. We cannot only learn about the Europeans, how beautiful they were, how wonderful they were. What about African Americans? All the inventions that American African Americans, you know, made. We need to know about those, you know. So un unless history is really taught to everyone equally, regardless of who they are, we're gonna have um, miseducated children, children who graduate high school without having a sense of their own history. When I say history, doesn't have to be black or white. What history? I mean, I want to know about your history because understanding your history. Really will definitely help me understand better mine. But if I'm, if I'm not being taught my history, then how am I going to really know who I am? And there's a reason for, for that. There's a reason why history is not taught to a certain group of students, because they don't want them to know their history. If you have a clear sense of your history, then you're going to ask questions. And sometimes there are questions that, they, they, that should not be asked, because they cause trouble. You know, they threaten people, they threaten the status quo. So I think, yes, we need to de-westernize textbooks. We need to de-westernize world history. We need to have a history that, that, is, that, a, that has a human face. Human face, it could be, you know, black, white, you know, Native Americans, African Americans, you know, Latinos, immigrants. Because now, the immigrants are increasing. So we need, we need to incorporate that, because it's part of American culture. It cannot only be about, you know, white Europeans, because they were not the only one who made history. We made history too. I didn't make history before then. <laughs> so we need, to, you know, we need to incorporate those in our, our textbooks. And as teachers, I'm not a history teacher. I wish I were, but I'm not. We need to uh, allow people to bring their own histories too, because we're making history now. We're making history, as, uh, as we're speaking. We're making history, OK? We make history. So in, so we need to combine all of this, you know, incorporate all of that, and, and they could make it, make it diverse, make it interesting, make it rich. Well, Pierre, I must say, first and foremost, thank you um, for giving this talk, but also thank you for um, 
Raising the flag. Raising the flag, for real. Um, it, because, you know, as a Haitian immigrant, as someone who's Haitian American, you know, and I use that term intentionally, and, and it'll connect with the question I'm about to ask, it's very important and poignant that, you know, the subject that you raise in your book is raised, um, particularly because of, you know, the academic things that I'm interested in myself. And so, in that sense, the issue of education under occupation, as you speak of in the book, is something to me that, you know, that is crucial to talk about because um, under occupation, as you explained, there's a lot of things that happen to an educational system, not to mention some of the colonized legacies that might have already been embedded in that system, so that, you know, it's kind of a double whammy. And so, as someone who participated in the um, educational system in Haiti, and then someone who also participated in the educational system here in the States, I have kind of, you know, an understanding of both, mm -hmm. in a sense. And so what Miles is speaking to, I've experienced, because, you know, I didn't learn about African American history. Maybe there's, you know, a section around February mm -hmm. on the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. and, and they'll show, you know, the movie Roots and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but for, for uh, on a basis of really covering black history and the multiplicity of it, that's something that I didn't get in my own country mm -hmm. that is a black country, yeah. nor here in this country. So, you know, and then you put in the piece about occupation, which got me thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, my own hyphenated identity, where Haiti experienced occupation and what the education system might have experienced as a result, mm -hmm. but then, you know, what is, what kind of, you know, what's the other side of, uh, of that occupation here in this country? Because, you know, um, as, um, you know, many talked about the relationship between the colonized and the colonized, um, you know, while the colonizer experienced something, the colonizer is doing something to him or herself as well. So, based on that, what kind of things, what's the other side of the occupation? The I mean, it's well. Let me let me. I would maybe add to what you said instead of answering your question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I know the answer to your question. Okay. Um, the colonizer. Well, they were very very smart. You know, they were very smart. The in, in terms of how they were able to uh, not only sell their ideas but make make the colonized believe that um, what well, make the colonized be a certain way that reflected not their own identity, but those of the colonizer. Unfortunately, when you have people who've been occupied or colonized for decades, even after the occupation, after the colonizers are gone or the occupiers are gone, mm -hmm. they have the tendency to reproduce what the occupiers, what the colonizers used to do to them. Someone who's oppressed, who's been oppressed, after self-liberation, that person might and cry, might end up reproducing what he or she was being a victim of. So that's the of, you know, people who are, you know, people who you know, occupied or colonized. Now, how do, how do we prevent that from happening? Well, it's through education. It's through, it's by teaching them their own history. It's teaching them, it's, it's telling them that, you know, you were not like that before the occupier came. You were not like that before the colonizers came. So this is where you were. This is how you were before they came. And this is how it became after the after they came, even while they came and after they left. So how can you go back to your roots to regain, to reclaim your own history, your own identities? That would be a challenge for teachers and for you know um, activists and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do it, but I would say it's through dialogue. It's teaching them their history, you know. Um, but you also need to learn about the history of the colonizer. But you also need to know about their history. Because if you don't know, if you want to defeat your enemy, you have to know about your enemy. I mean, I'm not saying the colonizer are the enemy, but in order to understand and realism, you know you need to learn about it. So, I don't know if that is your question. The other side, I don't know. I don't see it. I don't know it. I don't know how to explain it, to be honest. Maybe it's something that I need to do. So we said. Part two. Part two. That would be <laughs> the Yes, Pam. Yeah, how, how is your experience 
through the educational system in Haiti and here and from your, and your research? How has all that affected you as a teacher today? Good question, Pam. Um, and I'll make sure that I give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't like the way I was taught in high school. Um, how, was, how was I taught in high school? I would you know, see it and listen to the teacher, and the teacher would write everything on the board, and I would you know, copy it down, or you know, I would repeat like the parents that the teacher say, there was no dialogue, there was no uh, interactions. So I didn't like that at all. And this is how I would get myself in trouble. I would challenge teachers, they, they, would, you know, they would shut me, they would silence my voice, because they, they realized that I was, I was not stupid. I knew what they were doing. So when I came here, I had some teachers who, you know, we used the same method. But I was lucky. I was fortunate to meet some teachers who were wonderful, who engaged me in the classroom, who made me part of it, who made me feel that I was smart. But in high school in Haiti, I had a history teacher. In fact, I don't even go. He made me feel that I was smart. When I said something, whether it was stupid or not, he would engage me. He would, you know, take what I said and challenge me, problematize me. So, and Haiti had some teachers who did that. He had some good teachers who did that as well. Uh, so, but given my own schooling experience, I said to myself, I am not going to repeat what, what I experienced as a teacher, as a student in Haiti, and here as well. So I tried to engage my students, right? I have some there, some of them here, can talk, you know. You can, you can testify. So I tried to engage them. I tried to engage them. I tried to make them a part of the class dynamics, because if you just lecture all the time, and I don't see how you're gonna know the, 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 the students are learning or not, because you need to check on them. And how do you, how do, you do that? Is to call on them and or create activities that will make them participate in class, whether they want it or not. So, yeah. Thanks. And I'm sure you're doing it. Well. What advice would you give to uh, Caribbean, or Caribbean being like West Indian? Like West Indies, just what advice Caribbean. would you give Caribbean people to succeed in um, quote unquote uh, European world? To succeed what? To succeed, to make it. Like, to make it here? Yeah, to make it in the United States or anywhere. Well, I didn't make it yet, so I don't know how I'm going to advise you that. I'm still, I'm still in the making. Uh -huh. um, well, I'm going to give you the simplest advice. Um, be a friend of both. Don't be an enemy of, of books. Read and try to try to be open-minded and get help if, when you need it. Don't be don't be shy. Um, stay away from trouble. You know, by trouble mean like don't abuse God. Don't you know? Don't 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 think don't do things that gonna get you in trouble. That's gonna distract you from your work. You know, and um, read, read, read again. Read, read, and then what you read, share with what what you learn from your books. Share with your friends and have a peer mentor. There are plenty here. I mean, I can be your mentor, but can I be your mentor? <laughs> yes, I think I can. <laughs> yeah, so you need to have a mentor. I had one when I was in high school. It was not a teacher, it was somebody else. I acknowledge them in school. It was a mentor to me. I was 19 years old, and my, as I said, my mom didn't go beyond six years. My dad didn't know how to read and write. My brother, I'm the youngest, and I was the one who first got in high school. So in my family, I didn't really have anyone who was pushing except my mom. Although she did not go beyond sixth grade, but she knew the value of education. Yeah. She said, well, what I couldn't achieve, I'm going to make sure you achieve it. But the only problem that I had with my mom, well, it wasn't a problem. Unfortunately, she did not <coughs> grasp the concept of college. For her, finishing high school, finishing high school is enough. Because finishing high school in Haiti, back then, was such a great accomplishment. So for her, that was it. You finish high school, go get a job now. Help me. Help me, help me feed, feed the, the family. So, but she was an inspiration for me because she valued education. She encouraged me to stay in school. She would starve herself so that I, so, so that I had what I, what, what I, so that I had what I needed to be in school, to do well. So she, was, she, she inspired me. And I had a cousin who was, although he was a little bit uh, arrogant, but because he you know, went to college, I sort of looked up to him. So you need someone who can look up to you. Someone who trusts you, first of all, who trusts you. If someone doesn't trust you, don't even bother hanging out with that person. So that person has to trust you first. If the person is trusting you, 
then he's, he or she's going to be patient with you. So that's what you need. You need a peer mentor. You need a peer mentor could be a mentor could be you know one of your classmates. It could be someone in your neighborhood. It could be a family member. It could be just a friend. Um, I'm here. I'd be happy to to guide you if you need any guidance. Good. You don't have to be my student. I can always guide you. <laughs> Thank you. I think when I oh, I just had a question. Uh, you know, you hear so much about the multinational corporation and things, and things that are almost beyond our government and so forth. Do you think there are still possibilities of things we can do in our own country with the government to try to turn around some of this going on? Or is it beyond our hands now that it's become larger than one country? Well, you can start small by by being involved in whatever grassroots movement that are taking place in your neighborhood. Um, you don't have to go to show the time, we to travel, you know, we have to do so capitalism, we have to do so capitalism. I think you should, you should, what I would do, I would, I would um, talk to friends and, and colleagues and people in my neighborhood and, 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 and try to come up with what, what you can do to affect social change locally because you know, the local is, you know, is connected to the global. So whatever you do locally can impact the global or vice versa. So I would start small. I would try to help people um, develop some level of critical consciousness. We need to be aware of what's going on because the media, the mainstream media is not telling us the truth. So we need, we need to uh, find ways to help people develop uh, political awareness. Once they are politically aware, then they can take actions against um, abuses, you know, abuses of, 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 of any sort. So I will start locally, you know, start small and you build on it. And uh, if, you wish to, uh, if you wish to buy a copy of my book, I'll be happy to sign it. Otherwise, I will see you maybe a year from now when I write another book. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the library, um, I'd like to thank Pierre for sharing with us some of his life and um, giving us a glimpse into the socioeconomic and political effects of colonization and occupation in Western rest rest yeah. countries. I'm going to be looking for that in the lexicon in the future. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, Pierre spoke of critical consciousness. The role of educators is to encourage critical thinking. And I hope that his presentation today has given you some cause to think about these issues that he's brought up. So, you know, getting on the road of critical thinking. And the fact that your professors have brought you here today is a good sign of that. I'd also like to thank um, the faculty members that um, Pierre mentioned before, um, professors um, Diane Deere, Steph Fairman, and Tracy um, Ross Perkins. Thank you so much. Um, we have another presentation coming up in this room shortly on race, racism, and white privilege. Please come back for that. And don't forget, we have two more authors who are coming this semester. One by our own Professor um, Beers, she's right here, um, on history and legacy of animal rights, and um, the Elise Trepp on the um, Iraq survivors. So don't forget that's in um, November 8th and December 4th. Thank you so much for your wonderful <laughs> Thank you.